We're in John chapter 11 again. We just barely got started last time. In this long chapter on the sickness, death, and then raising of Lazarus, and then the aftermath. But let's read again John 11, verses 1 down to 16. We'll probably finish this today. Now a certain man of, uh, was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, so that we may die with him. Now this story, as I mentioned last time, is only in John, and it has a special place in John's Gospel. John, the evangelist, gives seven signs that show who Jesus was, to show that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And the raising of Lazarus is the last and greatest sign in the Gospel of John, you might say, except for his own resurrection later. And it's the only resurrection miracle in the Gospel of John. And this miracle is not just to prove Jesus' power itself, but he also has a special purpose, and he mentions that in verse 25 and 26, where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. So Jesus, by showing his power to raise Lazarus, shows he has the greater power to raise all of his people at the last uh, judgment. Also, this section of John is important in that it becomes the trigger, the final trigger for the Jewish authorities to bring Jesus to trial and then ultimately kill him. This is not too long before the final Passover, and this is one of the elements that the Jewish authorities use to bring Jesus to trial and then ultimately kill him. Now, to verse 1, it mentions here Lazarus of Bethany. This, this is the only section in John 11 and 12 where we meet Lazarus. Bethany is just a little bit east of Jerusalem, across the Mount of Olives, uh, on the east side of the Mount of Olives. So it's very close. It's a, it's a, a, a two-mile walk or so. And Jesus... Uh, loves his family, it says here. We meet Mary, who anointed the Lord with ointment. Verse 2, and later we'll see that in John chapter 12. And the sisters uh, have this brother, Lazarus, who's sick. And they send word, verse 3, the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But verse 4 says, when Jesus heard this, he said, the sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Lord, Son of God may be glorified by it. And I mentioned last time that this is one of those verses that implicitly shows Jesus' deity. Very often, Jesus claims the same sort of glory as the Father, the same power as the Father, the same will as the Father, the same purpose as the Father, in a way that no mere prophet would ever do. And so Jesus is either the greatest blasphemer in history, or he is truly the Son of God. And we see that when he talks about the glory of God and the Son of God being glorified by it because we know that God doesn't give his glory to another. We talked a bit about glory last time. What does it mean? 
and there's different aspects of it, but we talked about God's inherent glory, that is who he is, the sum of all his attributes, all the, the things that we know about God is, you might say, it's his glory. We see visible glory, the cloud, the fire, the smoke, especially in the Old Testament around the time of the Exodus, these awe-inspiring physical manifestations of who God is. We see creation glory. We see God's glory around us. Psalm 19.1, as we said last time, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. We have reflected glory. That is when we glorify God back to him, we praise him, we reflect his glory back to him. When we sing to his name, we praise his name. We also see his redemptive glory. That is, God makes his glory evident in the way he redeems a people for himself and his son. And then, finally, we talked about the embodied glory. The embodied glory of God and the person of Jesus Christ. We also trace the glory of Christ in the Gospel of John. Again, just briefly touching these points from last time to remind us. We glory in his character. That is, the Son of God reflects the exact character of God. We see glory in his power as he changed the water into wine. We see the glory in his teaching, the way he speaks, what he says. We see him glory in his Father. We also see glory from his Father. The Father glorifies the Son. John also makes reference to Jesus' glory, the Son's glory in the Old Testament. In Isaiah, remember Isaiah 6, when Isaiah sees the Lord on his throne That is the glory of Christ, as we'll see later in John chapter 12. We see his glory that he possessed in eternity past. In John 17, 5, Jesus says, "Uh, Give me the glory I had with you before the world was. We also see in John 17 that he will give his glory to his people in the end times. And then, finally, we will see his glory in the future. So in, in all these ways, Jesus is glorified in the Gospel of John especially. Now back to where we left off last time in verse 4. Jesus says, The sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. This phrase, not to end in death, is really not unto death. This sickness is not unto death. And it may be that he said this to the messenger. We're not sure who he's speaking to in verse 4, if it's just the messenger or the disciples more broadly. But if you got the message that this sickness is not to end in death, or not to death, that you might go back to the sisters and even Lazarus and say, Jesus said the sickness is not to end in death. So they might have the expectation that Lazarus would not even die. It's not unreasonable for us to think that the disciples understood here that the sickness would not result in Lazarus' death at all. Now, the temptation when we read the Bible again and again and again is we, we kind of know how it ends. And so we can't see ourselves in the, the place of those who are living in this In this time, if you were a disciple and just heard what Jesus said here, and you heard him say, the sickness is not unto death, you would naturally again think that maybe Lazarus would not even die. So there's no big rush for him to get to see Lazarus. Verse 5 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now this is, to me, one of the strangest and most unexpected statements in all of Scripture, isn't it? These verses seem to contradict each other. Now, Jesus loves these three people, verse 5, but when he hears that his beloved friend Lazarus is sick, he stays where he is. Now, any of you parents, if you heard that your child was sick, would you stay long in the place you were if you could help it at all? What would you do immediately? You'd go... And so for Jesus to love these people and yet stay when he hears that, uh, that uh, Lazarus is sick is really kind of a strange thing to, to see. It's amazing. Again, we know the story, how it works out. But if you were just to read this, you might think Jesus sure isn't very loving here, is he? Even to the disciples. Jesus has healed many strangers immediately, but for his Dear friend, he waits. This messenger comes, the disciples see this messenger, and Jesus says, well, he's not going to die, or it's not to end in death. So let's just wait. Let's just sit here. Now, Jesus didn't even have to go to Lazarus. He's healed from a distance before. Couldn't he just speak and heal Lazarus? But again, it seems like Jesus does nothing for a couple of days. He just waits 
He could have told this messenger to Lazarus that he would be well when he got back. If you look at John chapter 4, there's an example of Jesus healing at a distance. Verses 46 to 50. And Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. And that was about 20 miles away or so. So Capernaum was over by the uh, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Cana is some distance west, southwest. And he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee. He went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So this man made a, a long trek to, to see Jesus. So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. Now if we go down to verse 53, we see that the boy was healed. The father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives, and he himself believed and his whole household. So Jesus' miracle at a distance from some 20 miles away resulted in some kind of faith from this this family, this father and his family. So we know that Jesus can heal at a distance. We know that the disciples were aware of this. Why can't Jesus say the word and have Lazarus be healed all the way down in Bethany? But Jesus doesn't do that. He just stays for two days. And maybe the disciples thought that when Jesus said the sickness is not unto unto death, it wasn't going to be fatal and there was no hurry to get down to Bethany. And after all, recall there was possible trouble for Jesus down there. He has just, not too long before, left Jerusalem where he was under threat of death. So why doesn't Jesus just stay around up here in the north? I think it's by the Sea of Galilee. We're not totally sure where he was. I think it was probably on the east side of Jordan, up near the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus, why don't you just sort of do your miracles at a distance for a while? Don't bother going to Judea. Don't go to Jerusalem. You're just going to find trouble down there. But knowing what we know, having read the story before, that Lazarus was going to die from his illness, Jesus' delay only makes sense if we understand what he said at the end of verse 4. This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. This death, this momentary death, this four-day death, was not going to glorify, uh, not only going to glorify God the Father and God the Son, but would also be good for the good of the disciples, for Mary, for Martha and Lazarus, and for all those who would come to faith in Christ as response to the miracle. So it was for the glory of God that Jesus delayed. It was for the glory of the Son that that uh, Jesus delayed. It was also for the good of uh, Martha, for Mary, even Lazarus, for the disciples, and all those who would see this miracle and believe. Jesus even says himself in John eleven forty. To Martha, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So if Martha had the faith to see and believe, she would see God's glory in a way that she wouldn't see it if Jesus had not delayed. In allowing Jesus, uh, Lazarus to die, Jesus allowed others to see the glory of God, which is a gr- gift greater than any grief that they might have suffered. Let's look now at verse 7. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? As I mentioned earlier, they are away from Judea, and the threats in Jerusalem, as stated uh, in John chapter 10, and they are in a safe place as far as the disciples are concerned, out of the the sphere of influence of the, the chief priests and, and the uh, the Jewish authorities down in Jerusalem. And Jesus doesn't here say, let's go to Bethany so I can see Lazarus, but he says Judea, this general area of Judea near Jerusalem. And it, again, putting yourself in the disciples' shoes, maybe they've all but forgotten about Lazarus. A messenger comes, Lazarus is sick, Jesus says this sickness is not to end in death. So Jesus doesn't seem concerned about it. Why should we be concerned about it? Let's just wait here in in sort of the northern parts of of Perea or wherever he is. <clears throat> just we don't need to go to Judea. Why would you want to go down there?
but they ask him this question, why would you go down to Judea? <clears throat> and he gives a strange answer. He says, verse 9, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, what does this mean? It's, again, kind of a strange response. Remember, back in Jesus' day, the the day, the daytime, was divided into 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. Now, we have 12 hours, daytime roughly, and nighttime, but now our days are longer than 12 hours, and the nights are shorter than 12 hours, and when, when winter comes, it'll be the opposite. But in this time, the the daytime was fixed. When the sun went came up, the sun went down, that was your daytime. And so you divide that time into hours, to 12 hours. And so the the hours could be shorter. Our hours are fixed by the atomic clocks and all that sort of Our phones, our, these, these things that enslave us, tell us what time it is, down to the second. But in these days, morning started at 6, night started at 6, and noon was right when the sun was in the middle of the sky. And so you might have longer or shorter hours depending on what season of the year. It wasn't so um, so drastic down closer to the equator like Israel is. If you imagine if you lived in Alaska and you had these days that were defined by when the sun came up and sun went down, your days would be really long in the winter time, and that would be really short. The, the 12 hours of night would, might be just uh, an hour or two in, in actual clock time nowadays. But in any case, that's how they... They judged their days. When it was light, it was daytime. When it was dark, it was nighttime. They didn't have very good means of illumination. And we tend to forget what it would be like to live back then. If you didn't have a torch or a a feeble oil lamp with you and the moon wasn't out, was cloudy, it was dark there. If you guys go out someplace, maybe maybe the stars are really bright sometimes, but we forget how how dark it can be sometimes because we always have a, a flashlight our phone or or lights nearby. And so if somebody is walking in the night, you stumble. You don't have the light to help you. And so as we look at Jesus' answer here in John 11, 9 and 10, it does seem kind of strange. He brings up this whole thing about walking in the day or in the night. But I think we can get some illumination, so to speak, on these verses by looking at a couple of other portions of John. Look back at John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verses 3 to 5. And here we have the man who is born blind. And Jesus says, it's not that this man sinned, that, that he was born from born blind from birth. Not that he sinned, nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day, Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in, I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus here likens himself to the sun. We work during the day because that's when we can see. We work while Jesus is here on the earth because that's when his illumination is here. When he goes away, night is coming, and we won't be able to work in the same way. So verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. While Jesus is on the earth, he has work to do. Chapter 12, John 12, verse 35, a similar kind of statement. John 12, 35 and 36. Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. So while the light is here, follow the light, believe in the light, and work in the light. So this is a lesson I think like the one a couple weeks ago from Luke, where we saw that we are God's servants, doing only what we ought to have done. God has given us work to do as his servants, and while we have the light, we need to work diligently so that we can see and do, do the things that God has called us to do. I think we have echoes of this in Philippians one twenty two, where Paul says, If I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Would Paul rather be with Christ, or would he rather be on the earth? He'd rather be with Christ. But 
The reason he's not with Christ at that moment is because Christ has work for him to do. And while he is on the earth, he's going to live on in the flesh and do this fruitful labor. So Jesus, again, in this passage, verses 9 and 10 of John 11, the reason Jesus mentions the light and the darkness is, I need to go to Judea to accomplish a work. I need to do that work while it is light. So let's go and do the work that the Father has given to us. John eleven eleven. Let's move on. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So that Jesus says, let's go to Judea, verse 7. The disciples say, let's not go there. There's going to be trouble if we go there. Jesus said we have to go to work there. But now in verse 11, he gives a reason for them to go to Judea. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. Now again, put yourself in the position of the disciples. Jesus said this sickness is not to end in death a couple of days before. And now he says he's going to Judea to wake up Lazarus. Very strange. If he's fallen asleep, he will recover. You know, this term, falling asleep, is used often figuratively of death because it's a temporary state, not the soul sleep of some religions, but an idea of your body is asleep for a time. The body looks asleep, doesn't it, when it's dead, but when it, it will be raised up after some time. You might recall Luke 8, when Jesus heals this girl who has died, And it says, they were all weeping and lamenting for her, but he said, stop weeping, for she has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, knowing that she had died. She had died, but Jesus knew he was going to raise her, so she was asleep from that perspective. She was only going to be dead for a short time. Acts 7.60, recall Stephen as he's stoned. He cries out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. 1 Corinthians 11.30, Paul says, For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. It's not that they were sleeping during church. This is the story that Paul's talking about the Lord's Supper. They were taking it in an unworthy manner. Some were weak and sick, and a number have even died, actually, because of their abuse of the Lord's Supper and the the people of the church. And then later in 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And then speaks of the resurrection of the body. So, again, this idea of sleep, especially for Christians, it, you, being used figuratively of death, is, is a common one. But to the disciples right here, the talk of sleep means that they don't need to go to all the trouble of trekking down to Bethany. Why should we go from a place of relative safety up north take a couple days' journey down to Bethany that's close to Jerusalem for a man who's just asleep, who wake up on his own. He'll recover. Well, verse 14, Jesus finally is abundantly clear. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. We often see the disciples not understanding the subtleties of Jesus' words. I thought of Matthew 16, verses 5 to 8. Matthew 16, verse 5. The disciples came away to the other side of the sea, but they forgot, had they forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the scribes and, or sorry, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They began to discuss this amongst themselves, saying, He said that because we did not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Disciples thought Jesus was talking about literal bread, but he wasn't. He was actually talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus corrects them, and then verse 12, it says, Then they, the disciples, understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then the Gospel of John, earlier, John chapter 4. Another misunderstanding of the disciples, what Jesus was saying and another one of, of many we could look at. John chapter 4, verse 31. 
Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. They thought he was thinking of literal food. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So Jesus in Matthew 16 speaks figuratively of leaven. And here in John 4, he speaks figuratively of food. And the disciples just don't get it. They get confused because they don't understand Jesus' subtleties. And same kind of thing in John eleven fourteen. Jesus has to say to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, in their defense this time, Jesus has already said the sickness was not unto death. And why Lazarus would need Jesus to waken him from literal sleep would be a mystery to them. So they're confused. Jesus has to say plainly, literally, Lazarus is indeed dead. Verse 15, Jesus gives us another strange statement on this situation. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Jesus says that he was glad that he was not there to save Lazarus's life. He's saying that he's glad Lazarus is dead. But he has a purpose for all this, that they might believe. I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Jesus and the disciples needed to go to Judea, even to a place of danger, to have their faith strengthened. And the raising of a four days old dead man is greater than raising a sick man. They'd seen lots of sick people healed, but they had never seen somebody raised from the dead who had been dead for four days. And that miracle would strengthen their faith. Now, it's interesting to see this passage in light of what we just studied in Luke. If the harmony of the Gospels is correct, and Luke 17, the first part, precedes this section in John 11, then remember what it, the apostles just asked Jesus to do. Luke 17:5. They said, Lord, increase our faith. So the disciples, again, if the the harmony is correct, the disciples prayed a prayer in Luke 17, and Jesus answers it in John 11, a different book. No direct connection, but we can see that as we go through the harmonies. The apostles say, Lord, increase our faith. Jesus says, in effect right here, I'm going to increase your faith by allowing Lazarus to die. The disciples, just as we do, don't often believe until they see John 20, maybe the most famous example of this. John 20, verse 24. It says, Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. And Jesus here is gracious to accommodate their weak faith by giving them these obvious, indisputable signs. As he is with Thomas, appearing to him in person, saying, Touch me, see me. These are the wounds I had when you saw me on the cross. And Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And now that Jesus has strengthened the faith of Thomas and the other disciples, it's their job to be witnesses of what Jesus did and said. You're in John 20, and we read these verses again. Verse 30, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John, the evangelist, the apostle, was an eyewitness of Jesus and all that he did. He couldn't write down everything, but he wrote down what he did so that you may believe. 
he's sort of admitting here, perhaps implicitly, he had a hard time believing himself. The disciples' faith was often weak. Even seeing Jesus day after day for many years, they saw his life, they saw his power, and yet their faith was weak. But he wrote down this gospel so that those who read it, who have not experienced directly the, the power and person of Christ in the flesh, can still believe in him and have life in his name. John has a similar sort of statement in his first epistle. Look at 1 John chapter 1. His opening words. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that is Christ, of course. So he's seen, he's looked at, he's touched with his hands. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John is an eyewitness of Christ. He sees Christ. He experiences Christ. He knows Christ. And he wants to communicate that to the readers of his gospel and his epistles. That's his job as the apostle of Jesus Christ to proclaim what Christ has done so that those who have not seen Christ in the flesh can believe in him. So Jesus has a purpose, back to John eleven fifteen, for them to see the power of Christ and believe, have their faith strengthened as they see Lazarus will be raised. John eleven sixteen ends this way, ends our passage for today this way. Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also so that we may die with him. And here's our friend Thomas Didymus, as we just saw in John 20. Now the name Thomas means what, Thomas? Twin. Good. The word name Thomas means twin. It's from a Hebrew or Aramaic root. And what does Didymus mean? Twin, good. So, not a very uh, creative, perhaps, name for a man whose name is Twin, to have it in Twin in Hebrew and in Greek. We don't know if he actually was a twin. He may well have been. But who was his twin? We don't know. Thomas here, Thomas Didymus, may have had a name for Hebrew and Greek context, just as Saul and Paul did. When Paul was in a Jewish context, he was Saul. When he was in a Gentile context, he was called Paul. So you have a a, a more Hebrew, sort of Jewish name, for your Jewish context, and a more Greek name for those outside Didymus or Paul. We don't know a lot about this man Thomas. He's named in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but John is the only gospel where Thomas does anything. Anybody remember John fourteen six? Say it. Right, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. How many of that is a favorite verse for, for you? Use it often when you're evangelizing, when you're talking to other people who need to be encouraged. Who do we have to thank for that verse? Thomas. If Thomas had kept his mouth shut, we wouldn't have that verse in our Bibles. Thomas actually said in verse 5, he said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. Jesus said, I'm going away. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Because Thomas asked that question, because he wasn't tracking with Jesus, we have that beloved John fourteen six. So we can thank Thomas in heaven for the fact that John fourteen six is in our Bibles. And then, of course, we have the Thomas episode from John twenty we just looked at. What's the the word normally associated with Thomas? Doubting Thomas. How'd you like it if your whole life was summed up? We don't know how long Thomas lived. Let's say he lived fifty years. You have one bad day or one bad week, and that label gets attached to you forever. <clears throat> That's what people think of you. We'll meet him in heaven and say, hey, Thomas, you're the doubter, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I've heard that one before. <laughs> I've heard it a billion times. Thank you for reminding me. Um, we wouldn't want to have our whole life distilled with one negative adjective, would we? But that's what we think of Thomas, the doubting Thomas, and we would not be any better probably, would we? But in John 11, we see the doubting Thomas in John 20. What do we see here in John 11? 
we see him, has sort of a, a bold, courageous faith, doesn't he? Why don't we attach this to him? He's ready to go die with Jesus. But it is sort of pessimistic as well. Let us, a go, uh, let us also go so that we may die with him. Now, let me just say this. The capital H in some of your translations that associated with Christ isn't in the original. The, the Greeks did not capitalize certain letters depending on whether it was referring to Jesus or a regular person. Um, some commentators think that the hymn here refers to Lazarus. Come, let us go that we may die with Lazarus. But the, most of the commentators I've seen think that they're talking about dying with Jesus, which I think is, is correct. Jesus, we know, has already spoken of his coming death in Jerusalem. In Matthew sixteen twenty one says that from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So Thomas, if he was there in Matthew 16, would know that Jesus said he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to die there. And maybe Thomas figures now is the time and they're going to be killed along with him. But he's willing to do that for Christ's sake. So let's try to maybe call Thomas bold Thomas or something like that instead of doubting Thomas. At least balance it out sometimes. Remember Thomas's boldness in John 11, verse 16. Thomas is saying, in fact, Jesus is determined to go, and so it's our duty to follow him. Let's go with him. If we must die, let's do it. Well, that's how we're going to end the section for today. We'll see more next time about the actual raising of Lazarus, but let's have a few words of application for us. First of all, faithful followers of Christ can get sick, and we will all die at some point if Jesus does not come back first. Lazarus was a specially beloved friend of Jesus, but that didn't make him immune from illness and death. Now, that's a pretty obvious point. Some of us have been sick in the recent past. Some of you are sick now. You feel the aches and pains of getting older, many of us. But there are some who claim to be Christians that believe that sickness is never God's will or that sickness is due to a lack of faith. So if you're sick, it's because you don't believe in Jesus hard enough. But even Christians who have not been caught in the health and wealth movement can feel abandoned by God when their health fails. If you have sickness, you think, how can God let this happen to me? Let me read to you something from J.C. Ryle. He says, sickness, we must always remember, is no sign that God is displeased with us. You might say no necessary sign. That is, God may be disciplining us in sickness, but let's continue. It's no sign that God is displeased with us. No more, it is generally sent for the good of our souls. It tends to draw our affections away from this world and to direct them to things above. It sends us to our Bibles and teaches us to pray better. It helps to prove our faith and patience and shows us the real value of our hope in Christ. It reminds us that we are not to live always and tunes and trains our hearts for our great change. Then let us be patient and cheerful when we are laid aside by illness. Let us believe that the Lord Jesus loves us when we are sick, no less than when we are well. Let me repeat that. Let us believe that the Lord Jesus loves us when we are sick, no less than when we are well. Another point of application. God's leading may be confusing, but it's for our best. God's leading may be confusing, but it's for our best. Jesus' decision in John 11 to go to Judea was puzzling to the disciples, but Jesus knew they had to go there to have their faith strengthened. So if God leads you to a place you find perplexing or even frightening, ask him to strengthen your faith. God, what are you trying to teach me in this confusing period of my life? Next, God has a purpose for his people in suffering. And we'll look at this more as we work our way through this chapter. But remember that God knows the right time to heal and the right time for us to be sick. He knows us, knows when the right time is for us to be born, to live, and to die. And his ways may sometimes seem cruel and heartless, as they may have seemed in John 11. God, you say you love me. If you knew I was suffering, then why didn't you fix it? This passage says explicitly, Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters, so he waited. Jesus loved, so he waited. 
It seems, again, a contradiction. It seems wrong to us. But Jesus waits for a purpose. He doesn't wait because he's lazy or because he's uncaring or because he's cruel, but because he has a purpose. And if God seems to be waiting as you endure a trial, it's because he loves you. Remember John eleven four, Jesus said, The sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. But even if our sickness does end in death, it's for our good and for God's glory. So don't let these times of suffering cause you to doubt God's goodness. When you are suffering, God has a purpose in those things. He loves you through all of them. Another point of application is we can pray expectantly with God's love for us in mind. We pray not because, not just because God is powerful to answer our prayers, but we pray because he loves us. We pray as a child to a father. As we see here in verse 3, the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And we can pray the same way. Father, this one whom you love whom I love, is sick. And we can rest on God's love for that person, or even for ourselves, as we wait for him to answer our prayer. And we may not always have a miraculous recovery, but know that Jesus cares even more than you do about the outcome of this sickness or whatever suffering you might be going through. So if I care about my brother or sister's suffering, how much more does Jesus care? immeasurably more. If I love a brother or sister, I want to pray for them, want them to to be well. Christ loves them immeasurably more than I ever could. So we can trust his love for us, for his people, as we pray to him. One last point of application. Death is not final. For Christians, it is just sleep. We can rejoice in that, that Death is just temporary. We need not fear death because we will all be raised someday. But let me say as a point of warning, for non-Christians, we have the statement of Jesus in John 8, 24. Jesus said, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So for Christians who die, it's a, a gateway to glory. But for Those who die without Christ, you will die in your sins. And you need a Savior to come and redeem you from your sins, that you will not die in your sins. Christ came so that he would die for your sins, so that when you believe in him, you trust in Christ and put your faith in him. He will take those sins and he forgives them. And then you can die in Christ, die knowing that you will live with him forever. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the love of Christ We see in this passage, we see his love for Lazarus, for Mary and Martha, and for the disciples. Even though it seems strange, it seems cruel even to wait to heal Lazarus. Why didn't Jesus heal him immediately? We thank you, though, that Jesus had a purpose in this delay, just as you always have a purpose in delays to our prayers. For your glory, for our good. We pray we we would have the faith, the strong faith, to trust that you will do what you deem best in your good time. Help us to be patient in trials, to keep casting ourselves upon you, knowing that you care for us. May we we even in times of doubt uh, cast those doubts as sins upon you and ask for forgiveness and repent of them, knowing that you will accomplish your good purpose in us. For those who don't know Christ today, we pray that this would be a day of salvation. May they have true faith in Christ. May they be free of their sins. May they walk in newness of life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.